Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nettling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to become that confident leader and take your business and your life to the next level. Today, I am so excited to have Lorraine Ball on my show. And let me tell you just what, a little bit about Lorraine. After spending too many years in corporate America. Lorraine said goodbye to the bureaucracy, glass ceilings, and bad coffee to follow her passion to help small business owners succeed today. And this successful entrepreneur is an author, a professional speaker. She enjoys sharing what she knows about marketing in presentations to groups around the country in college classrooms, and in her weekly podcast, More Than a Few Words. She brings creative ideas, practical tips, and decades of real-world experience to every conversation. In her spare time, she loves to travel and take photos. I thought today we would talk about the conversion strategies of taking that landing page design and marketing automation to that next level to make you become that confident leader and make an impact in your business. Please welcome Lorraine Fall. Lorraine. It is so nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. (laughs) You're so welcome. And I just so much enjoyed talking with you that we're going to do this over and over again, I think, throughout our lives. (laughs) I hope So, so. Please share with my audience a simple question answer to the simple question of what country, what part of the country do you live in? Where do you call home? So I am based in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I've been here since 1992. So I guess it's home. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's funny for me. I, when I'm in Atlanta, I call it home. And when I go go back to Pittsburgh to see my family, I call that home. You know, I think it's home is wherever you have uh, people who love you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm an orig- originally, I'm a New Yorker. And so even though I've been gone and have lived here way more than I ever lived in New York, there's still a part of me that thinks of myself as a New Yorker. Yeah. You probably still move like a New Yorker too. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they definitely have a, a different gait to their Uh, movement around. (laughs) So I wanted to first, before we got into the whole thing of, of really landing pages, because I, I think they're such a powerful tool and people, I don't know, they always understand what they are, but let's talk about user generated content and why the audience should care about that. Oh, so in business, there is this idea that you can build mm-hmm. business and grow faster with mm-hmm. other people's money. Yeah. And when it comes to developing marketing content for your business, OPC, other people's content, <laughs> can fuel your business and give you that lift. Now, I'm not talking about stealing things off, scraping them off other websites, but getting your customers, your fans, your community to write about you, to talk Mm -hmm. about you, to share ideas with you. And, you know, when I talk about user-generated content, most people go immediately to the reviews, which is huge. Getting getting people to write uh, positive comments is a great tool, not just because it 
gives other people confidence, mm-hmm. but because it helps you understand what you really do well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but then there are other kinds of user-generated content. There are contests where you can ask people to take photographs and share information and mm. give you suggestions. And the thing about contests for user-generated content, the prizes don't have to be big. Yeah, They really don't. People, people just love to be acknowledged and mentioned. And thousands of people, when Jimmy Fallon used to put a question on Twitter, he would get thousands of ideas. And the only thing he had to do was say thank you and read a few of them on the air. Yeah. And so people would just kind of keep submitting. Um, Kellogg's runs a contest for different cereal flavors. Lay's potato chips is famous. Yes. A contest every year to develop a new flavor. And the beautiful thing about doing something like that, beside the fact that it gets people excited, <laughs> your customers will come up with ideas that you never thought of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I mean, Federal Express, they did not rename their company FedEx because somebody in their marketing department came up with it. Mm -hmm. Their customers called them that. And so they they went, oh, well, if they'd given us a nickname, maybe we should use it. Mm -hmm. Now I can't even imagine them under any other name. Right, right. So I used to work for UPS and it's one of the the reasons we just saw that trend of having a shorter name. And so we changed our logo and everything to be that short UPS rather than United Parcel Service. Absolutely. And it, it was the right thing and it was a good idea and it came from your customers. And mm-hmm. one of the other real benefits is particularly like if you ask people to write descriptions or ideas or comments, they're going to talk about your business using language that is relevant for them. And if you pay attention, you get terrific clues into your SEO. Yeah. Because those are the words that not only are they using to describe you, those are the words that they're using when they go look for you. Mm -hmm. And I remember whenever I was early on doing project management, we used to pay to have focus groups and they still do pay to have focus groups, but (laughs) truly the internet is the best focus group there is because you get a diverse uh, responses and things like that. And you know who your, your main audience is that you can DM people. And so, um, it's truly interesting how things have evolved over the years because of the internet. Oh, absolutely. You can get a tremendous amount of input. One of the things that I miss, because I used to do live focus groups as well, mm-hmm. and there is a an energy in a room when you're doing a focus True. group where people build on each other that you don't quite get the same way in a group chat. Yeah. But you reach a whole lot more people. And so mm. it's a trade, you know, it's a trade-off. Right, it's- right. I think you just treat it as one more tool in your tool belt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you really can take that information and maybe it's broad responses and then you can have that in-person people kind of to narrow down and get specifically what you're looking for. Absolutely. And you've got great content for your website. You have Mm -hmm. great content for, you know, for your landing pages, because now you know what people really care about. Mm -hmm. You know what's really causing them pain. And you begin to understand how you can solve their problem. Right. And what we find too is anytime somebody says, okay, I'm going to start my own business. And So I I think I need a website, although I will tell you, it's surprising to me how many people I interview that have no website, that they social media is their website, which, uh, you know, it's surprising to me. So why do people and search engines hate 
my website or in my being your website or anybody's website? You know, what do they dislike when they're going out and try to search? Well, okay. So first off, I, I want to go back just briefly. And mm-hmm. if you do not have a website, <laughs> you need to get one today. And and here's here's why I say that. Social media is great. You're going to get a lot more traffic and views on social media than you will on your website. Yeah. But there is only one place where you completely control the message. You control what people see, when they see it, how they see it. On all of the social platforms, you are subservient to the algorithm. Yeah. And you can build a lot of content on a platform and that platform can go away. Yeah. We had, um, we had clients whose Facebook pages got taken down for one reason or another. And all of the content existed only on Facebook. Mm. And it's gone in an instant. So you've got to, you've got to use your, your website as your home base. Mm-hmm. And Once you understand that, it's the jumping off point. You're going to create newsletters and link to your website. You're going to create social media posts and link to your website. But always to your website, the things that search engines hate is when they get to your website and it's a jumbled mess. And I got news for you. So do people. Mm -hmm. So you've got to really think about your structure more than anything else you do on your site is really think about what is the, what's the first page? What are the interior pages? How do I want someone to move through my website? And then you've got to make it easy for them to do that. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite tests is have somebody sit down and you're allowed to stand behind them, hands behind your back, (laughs) ask them to find something on your website. Yeah then say nothing else. Mm. Can they find it? Is it intuitive? What part of the navigation to go to? Or how does the search work? If it's not, that is the very first thing you have to do. Yeah. Then there's some mechanical things where you need to uh, make sure that you have headings and subheads and good descriptions, little excerpts for every page. And finally, at the bottom of every single page, there has to be a logical next step. Mm. Because if somebody gets all the way to the bottom of the page of your website and they don't know what to do next, do you know what they do? Click out. They link you. They click out. Mm-hmm. So you've always got to have, oh, okay, you just read a whole page about why group counseling is valuable. Well, what is the person who has just read this whole page on group counseling? What do they want to do next? Maybe you want to invite them to a Mm -hmm. session. Maybe you want them to download something, read something, watch something, whatever Mm -hmm. it is that needs to be right at the bottom. And then you take them to a landing page that is specifically constructed just to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Give them the information and trade it for an email address. Right, right. I know whenever I worked on projects for designing or changing our website, our UPS website, we would have those focus groups we talked about earlier to do just as you said. (laughs) You would just give us, give a design because so often the, the people that were programming it were so technically savvy that it made logical sense to them. But for me, it it was like, okay, I need my five-year-old to be Mm -hmm. able to go and figure out things here. And, Mm -hmm. and I was always big on, there should be more doors to, or points of entry than just one. Oh, the, that, um, that metaphor of the multiple doors, the way I used to explain it to my clients is we used to think about our website like a house with a front mm-hmm. door, came in, and then you went to all the rooms. That's not how people come to no. your website anymore. <laughs> they, they type into Google and they end up on an interior page or they end up 
in the middle of a blog post. And what you have to think about with your website is that it's a shopping mall. Yeah. And they're coming in from all these different doors. Your navigation needs to be like the directional sign in the middle of the mall that says, hey, go here, go here. Mm -hmm. But then at the bottom of every page, oh, you came to this article about babysitting. Well, mm -hmm. you must be interested in child children. Oh, you came to our dog walking page. Well, here's an article on pet health, or here's a course you can sign up for mm -hmm. on dog training. Or here's some dog food you can buy. Whatever it is right. you want them to do, it should be on that page. So that's the logical next step. Right, right. So then whenever you're trying to to convert them to that next step, sometimes people don't know. <laughs> you know, they're just curious. And, and so I think whatever content you have on there needs to be answering questions that will guide them maybe. Absolutely. Your entire website should be about answering questions. Mm -hmm. Why do people go to the internet? They go because they have a question. Mm -hmm. You know, the days of somebody typing into a search engine, furnace plus repair, gone. They go to the website or they go on their phone and they say, What's my, why does my house smell funny when I turn on the furnace? <laughs> you know, what is that smell coming from my furnace? And so those obscure questions, you have to, you have to anticipate them. You have to answer them. And then after you've answered them, you have to tell people, you had this question, here's the information, here's what you do next. Yeah. Don't leave them guessing because they mm -hmm. will get strong. That's why I loved FAQ pages. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of websites, and even my current one, I don't really have that much FAQs, but, but FAQs are great from a search engine optimization perspective because it does just that. You know, here's my problem here's a solution, you know, mm -hmm. and here's other alternatives. Uh, and uh, I, I think a lot of times we forget that too. Absolutely. It, and I, um, one of the, the interesting tests that we used to do with clients is we would have them generate a list of the, the most common questions their call center gets. There yeah. was this guest and they have this list of questions and then we would go to Google and type them in and see if there were related questions that came back. And then we would take that revised list of questions and go to the search bar on their website and paste that question in. Mm -hmm. Now, they just told me, we get all of these questions about why, why do we have to replace the subfloor when I, when I take out my flooring? Or people are always asking, what's the best flooring to put in my kitchen? Mm -hmm. And I would take that question and you know what I would find on their website? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I'm like, you just told me this is a question you get asked over and over again. It's a good question. Why don't you have an answer for it? Yeah. The, the other kind of way to look at that for the audience or the entrepreneurs that maybe you do a service, like for me, you know, I, I teach public speaking and leadership and, and different things. And I have courses on that. So some, some of the questions that you can Google out there to see, well, what else are people asking about public speaking or, or leadership that maybe I could create another course on or create a blog or something, anything to get them to come to my site and see me as that subject matter expert. And yeah, uh, I used to say that that's the answers are hiding in plain sight because Google's autofill, you know how when you go to Google and you start to type yeah. in something and it kind of gives you five or six suggestions. Mm -hmm. And if you click one of those, it gives you five or six more. And there's always that. And people also asked. Mm -hmm. And so there's an unlimited supply of questions and variations. And then you could take your questions to something like chat GPT and say, these are common questions. What other questions do people ask? And it'll generate yeah. a huge list. Yeah. And yeah. then just sit down and answer them. I know. 
And there you go. And you think, well, what, what's my next newsletter going to have? There you go. <laughs> it is right there. Absolutely. And then you create a landing page to say, I have a website. Would you like to be, <laughs> or I have a, a course. Would you like to be part of that? Absolutely. And the idea with the landing page, and I think this is where people confuse their homepage and their landing page. Your homepage is not a landing page. Right. It's a directional sign. It should mm -hmm. get people pointed everywhere on your website. A landing page is an individual purpose, very narrowly focused. It's mm -hmm. designed to promote one course, one workbook, one giveaway. Mm -hmm. And the objective of that page is to get you to trade your email address for whatever it is I'm giving away exactly. or get you to register or buy. Mm -hmm. And people, when they're constructing these pages, often think, well, but if they don't want that, I need to tell them about five other things. No, mm -hmm. you spent the resources to get them to come to this page to right. talk about this thing that's what you need to talk about. Yeah, because like for me, my summits, I create a landing page for that for them to register. But, you know, I, I don't even direct them back to my website. <laughs> I just have, because all I really want them to do is register for my summit. That's Yeah, know. absolutely. And once you get their email address, what are you going to do with it? You know, are you going to just add them to your general email list? Hint, that's not a good idea. No. They they have a specific interest. You need to have some specific content that addresses the questions that they have in more detail. And yeah. then they're more likely to hang around, register for other things. Yeah. So, oh, oh gosh, time's flying by. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> how should we narrow that target audience to to be able to grow our business what are some other tips that we could share with them well so first off you have to get comfortable with the idea that there's a difference between who you market to and who you mm. sell to. yeah um, coca-cola is a great example i am not in the target audience for coke you know i i have not had a real coke probably since i'm 25 because in a world with chocolate I'm not going to spend 25 calories on so uh, or 150 calories on soda. So there are other products that Coke makes for me, Diet Coke, um, the, uh, bottled water, et cetera. But if I go, and so they spend no money marketing to me. You're not going to see ads for Coca-Cola mm -hmm. on Lifetime Television or We Magazine. Mm -hmm. Just not going to see it. But if I go into a convenience store and I say, hey, I'd like a Coke, the person is not going to say, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, you're not in Coke's demographic. You can't have one. They're going to say, buck 25, have a nice day. <laughs> that's the key. You use your marketing to talk to a very narrow group of people. Other people will find you. Right. The first thing you got to figure out is who do you really want mm -hmm. to work with? Right. You know, I people click on that, that buy or that, mm -hmm. that need more information kind of thing. Then once you do that, you know, if you, if you do a landing page and you say, this tool is perfect for small to medium sized business owners, you know what? Nobody mm. knows what that means. But if you drive me to a page that says, are you a woman business owner? Are you in your first 18 months in business, would you like to discover five things you can do to make your website better today? Now that speaks to me. Right. If I create, I have the same tool, okay? But now I'm like, are you running a heating and air conditioning company too busy taking care of your customers to really worry about your marketing? I boiled your marketing down into five easy tools <laughs> just for you. Two very different messages. It's actually yes. the same resource, mm -hmm. but it speaks to two different audiences. Mm -hmm. And you can adjust the tools a little bit so that, again, the external trappings are different. Yeah. But you're, you're really honing in. And now you know that, woman, I'm probably going to be on Instagram 
for that woman. For the contractor, I'm probably going to be on Facebook mm-hmm. because he's going to he's going to be a little older and a little more old school, and I'm mm-hmm. probably going to have a better shot of reaching him there. And I'm not really going to talk to either of those groups on LinkedIn. Yeah. And and the interesting thing too is you can take what that those five things are, and you can ask something like Chat GPT, "Hey, I want to I want to reach these women entrepreneurs." such and such, or I want to reach these plumbers, or I want to reach these construction workers and, and ask for that message that will be the highest generation of a search engine optimization and all those things. And in seconds, it gives you a starting point. Absolutely. I will, a little bit of word of caution, because I do, I mean, I use chat GPT. Don't get me wrong. I tend to think the initial content that comes back is a little bit too salesy for my taste. And I have to go back and go, no, tone this down a little bit, make it a little bit more informative. You know, so you got to goose it a little bit. Mm -hmm. After about the second or third round of goosing, I'm like, okay, I got it. I'm going to take it from here. And then I just rewrite it in Mm -hmm. a way that makes sense for me. But it does give me some good suggestions. Yeah. And I think- the more that you put you into it, mm-hmm. then it's going to be, and you can say, you know, have it more in my tone, in my voice, in my whatever. So I, I think the more you put into it, the better it will become. Oh, absolutely. What I really like Chat GPT for is when I have content, I have a blog post, I have a book, I have a, a transcript from a podcast like this, mm-hmm. and I give it to, AI and say, summarize this. Yeah. Because now it is summarizing not generic stuff from the internet, exactly, but my original content. Yeah. That's how I use it. It's mm-hmm. because it, it does it in seconds, which would have taken me, could be hours with interruptions and all the things you get in your normal day. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so one of the things that, um, I'm sure we avoid is the business plan. And so share your thoughts on if entrepreneurs really need a formal business plan. The short answer is yes. (laughs) The long answer is the length of your plan and what you include will vary depending on how you're going to use it and what you need it for. Mm Mm-hmm. If you are running any type of business, at a minimum, you need there, and there are wonderful formats for simple two and three page plans, but you need to have a document that outlines at least where you are, what you want to accomplish, and really think through some of the, how am I going to get there questions? Mm -hmm. Where are my gaps? Now, if you are looking for a loan, you're going to have to do some pretty detailed financials and you're going to have to have a plan that doesn't just pull numbers out of thin air. You're going to be able to prove to the bank that there's some thought behind how you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. If you are looking for angel investors, the truth is most VCs don't believe any forecast that any business comes up with because they know better. Mm -hmm. What they're looking for is How good is your idea? Mm -hmm. Have you done the research? Do you really understand your market? And how qualified is your team to execute this plan? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and if you're doing it for your internal organization, the most important thing in that plan are your timelines and milestones. This is what we're going to do. And we're going to do it by this date. And these are the resources we need. And this is how we're going to get there. So you got to have a plan. But how detailed a plan will vary depending on what it is you're trying to do. So as a past project manager, I could say that's true, true, true. Mm -hmm. Some, if it's a simple project, simple plan. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a complex multi-year project. A little bit more time. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> so one of the last things before we move on to the slide is, 
is email marketing dying? <laughs> so I love this question. Every time I hear that question, mm -hmm. I am reminded of the quote from Mark Twain, where he said, the rumors of my death have been <laughs> largely exaggerated. I have been hearing since 2005 mm -hmm. that email marketing is dying. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I remember when, you know, Facebook really started to come on and everybody was using social media in 07 and 08. And they were like, oh, nobody is going to use email anymore. They're going to text message. They're going to chat. <laughs> what? We all open our email every single day. And that is not going to change any time soon. There are things that you can do in your email that you can't do in chat, that you can't do on social media. And so people will still have a place in their platform. Mm -hmm. now, are people more likely to unsubscribe? Are they more reluctant to join your list? Absolutely. But if you deliver good content, and I'll give you an example. I created my email program in December of 2002. So we're mm -hmm. talking 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. Over that time, people have come and go on my list. Business is open, they close, they move on. But I have people, well, today I have, and I have trimmed the list. It's been as high as eight, 10,000 names. And I've trimmed it down. If you don't open it, I take you off. Mm -hmm. I probably have 2,500 to 3,000 people on my list. I have a 40% open rate every week, wow. every week. And I have people on that list. It blew me away because I was looking at it recently who have been on that list since 2003 who still open it. Yeah. And so it's about good content. Now they don't open it every week. They have better things to do and I'm okay with that. Um, but they still open it and they still mm -hmm. read it. And it's it, it it's just a testament to if you have good content. Right, the value benefit. People will stay with you. Yeah, for sure. Wow, it has been awesome chatting with you. It's time now for me to share my screen. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. This is how you can get in contact with Lorraine and her website, for those that are just listening, is https colon forward slash forward slash more than a few words dot com. More than a few words dot com. On Facebook, she's at MTFW Club. Instagram is the MTFW Podcast. LinkedIn is her name, Lorraine Ball. YouTube at MTFW. TFW podcast and that MTFWP are all capitalized. I'm going to let Lorraine tell you what you can find on her website that might help you grow your business. Thank you so much, Vicki. If you come to more than a few words.com, one of the things that you'll see, of course, are the most recent episodes of the podcast. And all of the shows are very short, 10 minutes or less. You get some great insight, great marketing tips. In addition, there is a section called the toolbox, and this is filled with workbooks and white papers and links to resources that you can use to grow your business. And if you are ready for a little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, maybe you are just stuck and you need someone to help you think through an idea, you can book an office hours session just click on the office hours link and I'd be happy to chat. Awesome. So Lorraine, it was great the first time. It's great the second time. We'll keep on doing this. And uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, you are awesome. And as always, I remind everyone that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Metling. 
where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.